Good morning. Uh, happy Wednesday on a Thursday. Uh, this is this is the midweek message, uh, a day late, but that's the kind of week it's been for me. I, I hope your week has been going well. Uh, I, we will be in um, Genesis chapter 26 today. And uh, right now I'm speaking um, during a thunderstorm outside, so you might hear some thunder picked up in the microphone. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> I don't think it should be too distracting for you. Uh, but we'll be in uh, Genesis 26, and we're going to look at God's protection, God's continuing protection for Isaac and his promises reaffirmed, as well as some uh, interesting event that Isaac has with Abimelech. And we'll see if he does much better than um, Abraham did when Abraham had a similar run in. Uh, but Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 5. And it says, uh, Now there was a famine in, the, famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. So a new famine. And Isaac went to uh, Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistine, Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. So sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to your father uh, Abraham, or to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So that should sound familiar to you, I hope. But what God is telling Isaac now is that God has re, um, I guess, renewed or reaffirmed the promise he made to Abraham with Abraham's son Isaac. Isaac is the son of promise. And so God is saying, I'm going to keep my word to you and to your descendants because I kept my word to Abraham, and I'm going to continue that. And Abraham was obedient, so I will continue to be faithful. And uh, Abraham is blessed, uh, receives those blessings, because he was uh, obedient, and because he believed God. Uh, so, in uh, chapter 26, in these first five verses, what we some things to note here is that there is a famine in the land, and... As you recall, Abraham faced some as well that uh, at this time that was pretty severe and people would typically pack up and move somewhere else where there wasn't a famine. I mean, that makes just kind of makes sense. But God tells Isaac to not to go, to stay where you are, to stay in the land of famine. And God basically is saying, I, remember, I have promised to protect you. I have promised to continue your line and to make you a great nation and to bless you and your descendants. And he's reminding Isaac of the promise he made to Abraham. So God requests, God commands Isaac to stay in that land and to not, to not leave, to go against all wisdom of that time. Uh, all these, these things that just doesn't make sense. Why, why would you stay in a land that has nothing? Why would you stay in a land that has famine when you can move somewhere else? Um, many would go to Egypt, as it says there. Um, Egypt seemed to have its act together. Uh, and uh, God says, no, I want you to stay where you're at. Uh, I, want to, I want you to stay where you're at to trust me um, during this time. Uh, and so, because uh, Abraham had obeyed, God reaffirmed that promise with Isaac uh, as well. Uh, let's let's continue on and look at verses six through sixteen. Uh, basically, I'll just go through this passage and highlight some things, and then we'll make some application at the end. Uh, it says in verse six, so Isaac settled in uh, Gerar. Uh, when the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said. She is my sister, for he feared to say my wife, thinking, lest the men of this, the place should kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. Um, so, unfortunately, Isaac follows the same pattern as his father Abraham did. As you recall with Sarah, 
and he stretched the truth and said um, that she was his sister and here we find Isaac lying in the same way that he is um, saying that she's just his sister not his wife because he feared for his life and again that's just um, poor leadership uh, for a husband um, if you want my opinion <laughs> and Kind of gross, too, <laughs> to be honest, thinking about that. Uh, but he lied because he was afraid, and he forgot what God had promised just in verse verses 3, 4, and 5 here, that I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, that I will give your offspring all these lands, that uh, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. You know, he's reminding Isaac of Abraham's blessing God would have taken care of him. God would have protected him here if um, if he needed it. And God does still protect him in spite of Isaac's um, deception. And so, uh, so that's in ver verses 7 and 8 there. Uh, so verse 8, it says, When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. Um, and other translations bring out more of the um, tender nation or tender um, expression uh, between a husband and wife. Uh, some will say that they were um, affectionate. Others will say he was like uh, um, hugging her or embracing her, something like that. They were being romantic. You know, they were being loving towards each other. And, you know, nothing inappropriate with that, of course, for husband and wife. And Abimelech sees this and he says, now, of course, he has questions. <laughs> he says, behold, she is your wife in verse nine. How then could you say she is my sister? Uh, basically, why did you say that? Why did you lie? Isaac said to him, because I thought lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this that you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So God protects him in that. And his his sin, his lie, is found out. Um kind of a dangerous position for Isaac. He's been deceptive to Abimelech, a powerful king, and caught in his deception, you know, Abimelech could have thrown him out of the country. Abimelech could have had him killed, but he understood. He, um, I think the Lord intervened here on, on his behalf. We see God's protection of him in verse 11. Let me scroll back up here. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So he, he put his protection on Isaac and on uh, on his wife. This, you know, I, I'm trying to think, how would this look different if Isaac had trusted God um, to begin with? Maybe she would have been taken. Maybe he would have been fine. Uh, we don't know because he didn't give God the chance. But now when he is in trouble through his own fault and through his own sin, God shows his mercy, his grace, his faithfulness, and he protects Isaac. God is able and willing to keep up his side of the bargain, um, even though Isaac and oftentimes ourselves, we fail to keep up uh, our end of the bargain. So, Let's look at uh, verse 12. It says, And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the year, in the same year, a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So now um, Isaac and Abimelech are not doing so well. Uh, there, there's been some envy and there's jealousy and there's trouble that has been um, provoked. But we see God's provision and how Isaac has been blessed a hundredfold 
in one year. I mean, can you aman- imagine, for those of you who farm, can you imagine reaping that much harvest in one year that you get a hundredfold of what you planted, that you've been um, blessed that much and that abundantly? God is powerfully demonstrating his care and concern for Isaac and his family. And of course, you remember Jacob and Esau, um, they were not able to have, uh, Isaac was not able to have children, and God um, blessed Rebekah and, and gave her uh, two sons instead of one, when she could have none. Uh, so God continues to abundantly, abundantly bless Isaac, even though he doesn't always deserve it. I think there's a, a valuable lesson for us there as well. Um, you know, it gets to the point where the Philistines and Abimelech are jealous of Isaac and they want him to leave and they cast him out and they fill in the wells. This this is really um, almost an act of war because, you know, in the desert community, you need water, obviously, to be a farmer, to be to, to water your your flocks, your cattle, your camels, all that. You need water and to fill in the wells. I mean, that's the worst kind of sabotage. Um, so Isaac, instead of retaliating with violence, let's look what he does in verse 17. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. And when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, This water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek, because they contended with him. Uh, and then the word Essek, it sounds like the word contended in Hebrew. Um, because uh, they contended with him, they dug another well, and they quarreled over that also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So Isaac, instead of retaliating in, in violence and or um, responding in kind, he just quietly went about and, and dug more wells. And, and there kept being conflict over them, so he'd dig another one. And conflict over that one, he'd dig another one. Finally, <laughs> there was enough. And, you know, we could say, oh, I- Isaac was being treated unfairly and Isaac should have stood up for his rights and this and that. But I think Isaac is showing the grace and showing the kindness that God showed to him when Isaac was be- being deceptive and lying about his wife and uh, things like that. Here, I, I think he's learned a little lesson. I think he's learned a bit of, of a lesson about about uh, grace and about mercy. Um, and he follows and he shows the, the grace and mercy that God has shown him. And folks, this is, um, I mean, this is a powerful thing. That God has shown us such grace and mercy. That he has forgiven us our sins through Jesus Christ. He has... Um, demonstrated his love towards us. He has saved us when we were at our worst. He helps us even though we're in trouble, even though it's trouble caused by our sin, God helps us. Uh, So let's show that same kind of mercy and compassion towards others when they sin against us. Instead of responding in anger, we can respond in kindness and maybe even do something helpful uh, for them. Uh, let's look down in verse 23 now. It says, From there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he, Isaac, built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. Uh, You know, 
he's had some bad luck with wells lately. But anyway, <laughs> Isaac's servants d dug a well. And when Abimelech went to him from uh, Gerar with Ahuzath, his advisor, and, and Fikol, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to see me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? Now, here's where the tension of the story comes. How are they going to respond to Isaac? They've cast him out. They've attacked him. They've f filled in his well, his wells. They fought with him over wells. And now God continues to multiply and to bless him. He's settling down. God said, I'm going to give you this land. He builds another well. And now here they come again. How are they going to respond to Isaac? They said, in verse 28, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you, and have done to you nothing but good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So Isaac made them a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths. And Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. The same day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that they had dug and said to him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. And I know you will recognize that name if you've done any kind of um, Old Testament reading. Uh, when Esau was 40 years old, now this is Isaac's son, if you recall, he took Judith, the daughter of Beeri the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemith, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. And there, as you know, um, God is going to tell Isaac, uh, well, see, God had told Abraham not to choose a wife for Isaac among the pagans, and so he didn't. Um, I think that's his plan as well for uh, for Jacob. But here Isaac does take his wife from people, well, his wives, excuse me, his wives from people who are not followers of God, and that's going to cause them grief. And, it caught, made, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. But I want us to point back to, or look back to um, what happened back here in verses 28 and 30 and all that that God or that Abimelech came with with others and and look what he acknowledges he says we in verse 28 we see plainly that the Lord has been with you so we said let there be a sworn pact between us okay Abimelech says we want peace with you now because we see that the Lord has been with you through Isaac's actions Isaac's the, the blessings that he's had, the way God has protected him, and I think the way that Isaac has behaved, um, especially in response with the wells, that that made an impact on Abimelech and those who were with him. They saw God in his life, and they wanted to be at peace because they realized this man is powerful, his God is powerful, and we cannot hope to stand against that. We need to make peace or we're going to be in trouble uh, and so they come and make peace they feared the Lord and as scripture says the, the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord so a uh, couple of things to apply for us today one is as I've said treat others the way that God has treated you God has shown you great grace and great mercy and I want to tell you that if you want the greatest impact that you can have in a person's life is to treat them with that same level of mercy and grace that God has shown you. Even if you disagree with them on everything, even if you are, you know, political opponents, if you are um, in different um, economic statuses, if um, you hate their guts, you know, if they hate your guts, whatever, um, Whatever the case, treat them with the love and grace that God has shown you. You will be amazed at the impact you can make in a person's life when you show them what God's love is like in your behavior. Um, of course, this passage also teaches us about God's faithfulness, um, a, a subject I talk about a lot. Uh, 
that we see God reaffirming his promises to Isaac and renewing that covenant and promising to uh, take care of him and his descendants and to make him a mighty nation. Uh, and he re reminds them of the promises that God, uh, that he made to Abraham and intends to fully um, keep those promises and to fulfill it. Um, also, on a more practical level, let's not overlook the influence a parent can have on a child. Um, they, they say that um, your convictions are caught more than taught. Uh, you know, we can teach our kids, every, you know, what's right and what's wrong, but they're going to learn from our behavior. Um, they're going to learn by watching us. And some of the things that frustrate me the most about my children are the things that I see in their life that I know they have learned from me. And and I know it, and I see it, and I get it. And you know what? It's, that's frustrating to see my sin on display in my, my children's lives. Um, so we need to never underestimate the impact a testimony, a parent's testimony can have on a child. Um, so, you know, when I was a kid, we used to sing in Sunday school, um, the song, Oh, be careful little eyes what you see, and Oh, be careful little hands what you do, and you know that, you, you know that song. I'm not going to sing it for you. I'll, I'll spare you the agony. Um, and that was sung to children. Uh, but I think that's a great song to sing to parents and to adults who are role models, to be careful what you do. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure my wife has sung that to me before, <laughs> uh, but uh, we won't we won't go into that. Um, that uh, because they are watching us and they are learning from us, so we need to be careful. Um, Isaac learned some good things from his father Abraham. Unfortunately, he learned some bad things too. Um, and you know that's that's human. That's that's life. But be careful. We have this great opportunity to invest in our children's lives and let's let's take advantage of that uh, and then also uh, finally uh, beware of envy and the nature of envy here and how it drove um, Abimelech and his followers and the Philistines to to take to get uh, to kick Isaac out and to cause trouble for him and to fill in the wells that his father had dug and caused him extra work and threatened his life really when you take away somebody's water um it's it, you know it's a dangerous prospect and yet isaac responded in in i think in kindness and in grace but envy can drive you to make very destructive choices uh, so let's be aware of that and as um, i preach on sunday from philippians chapter four to be content to learn to be content as it says in Philippians 4 uh, and verse uh, 12, I, I believe it was. I don't have that right in front of me here. But um, that we learn to be content, whether we have a lot or we have a little. You know, it can be hard to see that, to see others with with a lot of the things that we want and say, oh, I wish I had that. I wish I had that. And then envy drives us to do things that are very foolish. Um, that's a sin. And God wants us to be wary of that. And we see the impact um, that that has in, in Abimelech's life and in, in the life of the Philistines. Um, so beware of envy. All right, and that's um, Genesis 26 this morning. Uh, I, I, enjoyed, I enjoy spending time in God's word with you. And I don't know, maybe you've heard some of the thunder booms in, in, in the background. Um, so that kind of helps set the scene for us, I guess. Uh, give it a more... Um, relaxing atmosphere maybe unless you don't like thunderstorms so um, but it's neat to be talking about God's power and then just here even hearing outside um, the thunder the rain and seeing that demonstration of God's power um, in just a simple way um, providing the water that uh, I don't know about your garden but my garden desperately needed uh, so uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that all right uh, just a couple of brief things before I go um, again, a reminder, this Sunday we're having a special offering for um, the backpack ministry for the kids going back to school. Uh, we've already had a few folks contact us to, um, to get some backpacks, so we're going to be doing that. 
uh, for uh, the kids in the community. Uh, so if you have uh, want to give to that uh, ministry, um, we'll, we'll be having a special offering on Sunday for that. And then also, if you saw in my email, um, we'll have, we're will have we having a baptism this Sunday as well. Um, Gracie is going to be baptized. And uh, I, I'd encourage you, if you're able to come, to come and, and be an encouragement to her as uh, she walks in obedience to the Lord uh, in baptism. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you are too. So we'll see you here Sunday morning, Lord willing. And uh, you all take care and know that we're praying for you. Um, and so we'll see you later.